Welcome to today's webinar, Suburbs for Everyone, How to Rethink, Redesign, and Redevelop the Burbs to be More Affordable and Livable, hosted by the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network and is partially funded by um, the US EPA Office of Community Revitalization and is managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website, smartgrowth.org, that serves as your one stop on the web for the most current information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. We provide news and information about events, funding opportunities, awards, and resources to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is also the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of smart growth. This webinar, webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Clearinghouse on smart growth topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. We are recording this webinar and we'll post it on our website in the next few days under the webinar archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and subscribe to our e-newsletter to get the latest news and information about smart growth and to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and also 1.5 CNUA CEU credits. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org. Log into your account and search for the name of today's event, which is Suburbs for Everyone, How to Rethink, Redesign, and Redevelop the Burbs to be More Affordable and Livable. You can also search for event number 918-6192. So to get started, our speakers today are June Williamson and Dan Reed. June Williamson, RA Lead AP, is Associate Professor of Architecture and Urban Design at the Spitzer School of Architecture at the City College of New York, CUNY. Or SUNY. She is co-author with Ellen Durham Jones of Retrofitting Suburbia, Urban Design Solutions for Redesigning Suburbs, and author of Designing Suburban Futures, New Models from Build a Better Burb. Ellen and June are also finalizing a new book, the Retrofitting Suburbia Case Studies, forthcoming in 2020. During a 25-year career, she has practiced and taught in New York, Los Angeles, Atlanta, Salt Lake City, and Boston. A frequent speaker and consultant, her writing is published in the books Retrofitting Sprawl, Social Justice in Diverse Suburbs, Independent for Life, and Writing Urbanism, as well as many journals, magazines, and blogs. June has a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture from Yale, a Master's of Architecture from MIT, and a Master's of Urban Planning and Urban Design from the City College of the City University of New York. Dan Reed is a planner at the Tool Design Group in Silver Spring, Maryland, and has worked with communities all over the United States to get their streets safer and more enjoyable places. Dan also writes on planning issues with work appearing in publications including the New York Times, The Atlantic, Architect Magazine, Greater, Greater Washington, and Washingtonian Magazine. Dan has a bachelor's degree in architecture and English from the University of Maryland and a master's degree in urban planning from the University of Pennsylvania. Following the presentations, our panelists will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime during their presentation by using the questions tool in the control panel located on the right side of your screen. Now I'm going to turn it over to June to get us started. Welcome, June. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm excited to share with you all today. Uh, for more information about me, I invite you to consult the many books and articles that have been written um, by me and, and others on this topic. So let's plunge in. Um, we'd like this webinar to contribute to a paradigm shifting conversation. Uh, so instead of going over case studies, as I often do in my talks, uh, I'm going to go back to basics. Um, and 
as I already said, you can find many examples, case studies, design strategies, and tactics in my published works. Um, so let's start with this enduring definition uh, supplied by the eminent historian Kenneth Jackson. Uh, suburbs are affluent and middle class Americans live in suburban areas that are far from their workplaces, in homes that they own, and in the center of yards that by urban standards are enormous. Now, I say this definition is, is controversial, and, and why? Um, I would point out the insistence on affluence and middle class status as being uh, part of the definition of, of suburbs. So this contributes to an enduring stereotype that um, from our perspective today can be seen as an impediment to productive new conversations. And it bolsters uh, somewhat simplistic comparative thinking that pits suburbs or the suburbs in the singular um, against cities. Uh, historian Dolores Hayden in her definition um, adds the component of communitarianism or a, a neighborliness in a, in a sense. And she also has feelers out in her, her work for feminist and, and gender aspects um, in understanding suburbs. Um, I hope you listeners don't think this is too remedial to go back to these basic definitions. I, I think to shift a conversation, it's often vital to go back to the basic assumptions and to probe and to uh, poke them um, a bit. So, to do that, I'm going to run through a, a condensed history of North American suburbs uh, viewed through a series of six paradigms that exerted strong influences on the sprawling landscapes that dominate today. So first up is the pastoral paradigm. Uh, that is the idea that in the face of industrialization in cities, a more moral life could be created outside the city, uh, where nature could be tamed and domesticated. Uh, this Hudson River School painting uh, exemplifies the ambivalence at the time towards what scholar Leo Marx called um, the machine in the garden. Uh, and on the left is an Andrew Jackson Downing, um, his famous landscape architect of the time, um, his scheme for, uh, quote unquote, improving working farmland into a picturesque uh, country estate. And this is Riverside, uh, the iconic early planned railroad suburb designed by Frederick Law Olmsted uh, with its distinctive teardrop blocks um, and designed explicitly without fences or walls to create the illusion of living in a large leafy park. And we might note that Olmsted was quite bullish on suburbs. And here's a recent view of the pastoral streetscape in, in Riverside, um, that idea of living sort of embedded in, in a park where the architecture just fades away. In recent years, the um, bourgeois utopia of the elite suburban enclave uh, was alive and well, uh, as evidenced by McMansions and uh, grotesquely um, scaled up subdivisions. And I've got this cartoon. So, so what's the joke here? It's really about taking uh, this idea of privatization uh, to, to um, the extreme. Um, so this is a narrative, um, an elitist one, that opposes the communitarian thread that Dolores Hayden teased out. Um, and this ongoing narrative draws on anxiety and fear and can amplify societal divisions, I would say. Um, the next paradigm, the uh, streetcar paradigm, concerns the transportation revolution that occurred as amazing new technologies extended the reach of the walking city and dramatically altered patterns of um, urban development or urbanization. Again, historian uh, Kenneth Jackson, he called it the time of the trolley. Uh, and you can see here uh, the extent on the right of the privately built trolley system that existed at one time in Brooklyn. And there were similar systems in place in all uh, North American cities and in many suburbs, um, though most were completely dismantled by the early 1960s in favor of buses or alas, uh, no mass transit at all. Uh, people of all classes um, because of the, the emergence of the streetcar, we're happy to flee the chaos and crowding of downtown uh, neighborhoods and districts. 
Uh, streetcars opened up vast areas for development, uh, mostly in a distinctive gridded and connected, though not at all picturesque, um, pattern of closely spaced houses. And in contemporary developments, however, this connectivity is often lacking, as in on the lower right, um, these back-to-back -back, uh, cul-de-sac, which make no sense. Uh, so the culprit, we could blame the automobile. Uh, Henry Ford's innovations in production and pricing made this new technology widely available, and the love affair continues unabated to this day, a full century later. Many people, uh, perhaps many of you uh, listening in, uh, place faith in the development of new technologies to help us escape the global environmental calamity of climate change brought about in no small part by the fossil fuel appetites of the automobile, and more broadly, the resulting sprawling land use patterns that we live with uh, today. We've all indulged in the fantasies that are being widely promoted for autonomous vehicles. So what were architects and planners uh, dreaming up during this period of rapid urbanization in the United States and, and Europe? Uh, the socialist utopian Ebenezer Howard's visionary ideas for garden cities have proved enduringly influential. Uh, his concept was to combine the advantages of both town, that's one magnet, and country, another magnet, while mitigating the ills uh, and then establishing a new third magnet, uh, what he called the town-country. Uh, um, that is cooperatively owned satellite garden cities, uh, with bright homes and gardens, no smoke, no slums, uh, with freedom and cooperation, along with low rents and high wages. Sounds pretty good, right? Uh, so the first Garden City was built north of London along a railroad in 1906. And uh, the cartoon on the right, you can see Ebenezer, I've uh, circled him. Um, the cartoon mocks the reputation of those early residents of Letchworth as bizarre, sandal-wearing, half-clothed vegetarian, eating fruits and nuts. Um, Howard, by the way, developed many of his radical ideas during a sojourn in the United States. Uh, and for some fascinating little-known stories of suburban communitarian experience in the United States in the 19th century and, and through the 20th century, I do recommend a, a recent book uh, called Radical Suburbs by Amanda Colson Hurley, where she tells some of these, these little-known stories. Um, but for the most part, Garden City ideas were imported to the United States and tamed, that is, de-radicalized, into a design alternative to monotonous, monotonous uh, streetcar subdivisions. Uh, so Clarence Stein and Henry Wright articulated the need for new towns uh, designed, quote, for the motor age, um, as at Radburn in New Jersey. And thus was born the American cul-de-sac, uh, though at Radburn the houses face the footways, uh, not the, the motorway. Um, later, developers adopted these cost-saving street layouts while eliminating the footways and the shared parks that would link everyone uh, together. And so today, um, let's see, another, oops, another American visionary, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, his notion for what he called Broad Acre City was refined over decades, though never notably uh, implemented. Uh, the conceit was to re-ruralize the populace into minimum four-acre agricultural plots. Um, the ex extremely low density development pattern would be navigated by cars traveling on, at the time, newfangled freeways. You see the on the lower left uh, his idea for an inter interchange, uh, and by, of course, personal helicopters. And so today we have the apotheosis of these various visions for um, urban decentralization. But it's vitally important, I'd say, to um, remember that suburbs are not, and never were, as homogenous as we tend to imagine them. Uh, some of the stereotypes have their roots in marketing and lobbying campaigns of groups like NAREB, uh, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, um, who were unabashedly in the business of building and selling the dream. 
And here are some images of self-built working class and African-American housing on the outskirts of Detroit. And these photos were taken in the early 1940s. Um, so the black neighborhood on the right was segregated from an adjacent white neighborhood by a concrete wall, which you see in the top image, um, which the Federal Housing Authority required the developer to build before ensuring the newer white development. Um, in the interest of uh, homogeneity within neighborhoods. That was the rationale. And these standards were codified in the FHA's underwriting manual. Uh, so places that had been more mixed before this became uh, uh, increasingly and explicitly uh, segregated. The roots of this kind of structural racism in suburbia extend back to racially restrictive uh, private deeds um, as at the Country Club District in Kansas City, which was established in uh, 1910. And you can see on the sign here, they're explicitly advertising um, 1,000 acres restricted, um, protected residence property. And people understood what those, those terms um, uh, were codes for. And then there are the uh, infamous federally commissioned 1930s uh, homeowners loan corporation maps uh, that led to discriminatory redlining. Um, these historic maps are where the term gets its name, uh, the areas that were colored in red on these maps. And, and the maps were once obscure and difficult to find, but they're now all scanned and geocoded and searchable on, online. Um, so here's the example from Kansas City, and I've uh, circled the uh, country club district. Um, from the previous slide. And you can see it's all green and blue. So the legacy of this discriminatory history is seen today in uh, predatory lending practices, racial steering, and other uh, inequities. Um, for a narrative summary of this topic and a provocative argument demanding legal remedy, I recommend Richard Rothstein's uh, recent best-selling, The Color of Law. So, now we come to the most uh, stereotypical suburban paradigm, the cul-de-sac paradigm, uh, which characterizes the post-war period of mass uh, suburbanization. And in the housing boom from 1944 to 1965, uh, 26 million new non-farm homes were built, mostly in suburbs, and much of it by a small coterie of large home builders. So this really becomes the ring of well, now inner suburbs, but just outside the, the streetcar um, suburbs in most um, metropolitan areas. So Park Forest outside Chicago was an iconic example. And here amid the coffee clutching women, uh, we may note the prominent presence of a television, uh, the suburban window on the world at that time. And another iconic post-war plan subdivision was Lakewood outside Los Angeles, uh, where large scale production builders took advantage of the federal loan programs to, um, some say illegally, but to efficiently transform large tracts of agricultural land seemingly overnight. I do uh, recommend city planner J.D. Waldy's um, me memoir, Holy Land, uh, in which he poetically describes life on the grid. Um, and he does defend Lakewood now, today in the 21st century, um, as a model of integration, diversity, and continuing relative affordability uh, within the context of metropolitan uh, Los Angeles. So these places have evolved and changed over time. The cultural backlash, however, was almost immediate. Uh, Malvina Reynolds and Pete Seeger mocked the ticky-tacky boxes of Left Town, Daly City, um, and countless other places. Saintly Jane Jacobs weighed in about her perception of the new suburbs as places of soul-crushing boredom and conformity. Uh, the photographer Bill Owens, who lived in uh, suburbs himself, had a more empathic from the ground up point of view. And he was doing this, this work, this book came out in 1970, um, in this example quite literally. Uh, and the man is quoted in the caption, I'm not sure if you can read it, saying, in one day, you'll have a front lawn. Ah. Now, the spawn of this period includes um, the rise of environmental activism. As suburbanites were hit uh, with pollution seeping up in their own backyards through uh, uh, septic and um, cesspool systems. Uh, in this case, detergents from faulty septic tanks 
um, turning up in tap water, which was called white beer. You see the photo on the, the left. Um, legacies of this strand of suburban history include both the emergence of new urbanism and uh, the smart growth movement, I would say. So some of the people who were founders of those movements had kind of cut their teeth in this, um, in this period. There was also second wave feminism. Um, as many as those uh, coffee clutching housewives in the earlier photograph uh, soon became disillusioned with their, with their luck. And uh, finally, the sprawl paradigm. Um, so in the late 20th century, we saw an explosion of non-residential uh, development in suburbs as office jobs and retail decanted out of center cities and vast unplanned agglomerations of office parks and shopping malls uh, dubbed edge cities by the journalist uh, Joel Garreau, um, they sprung up like mushrooms at the highway interchanges. So here we see um, Tyson's Corner. Supersized regional shopping malls were built as all-in-one destinations uh, although the Mall of America, pictured here, was arguably uh, the last or one of the last of its breed, at least in North America, uh, not speaking for other regions around the globe. Um, and note the happy just married couple uh, enjoying a ride at Camp Snoopy on the right, from the kind of early 90s view. Uh, and here's an interesting scalar comparison. So on the left, we have the entire city of Havana, Cuba. And on the right is one single shopping mall in Florida, uh, pictured at the same scale. So uh, an enduring question for me as an academic in the disciplines of architecture and urban design is, uh, how can we best leverage the lessons of this history of suburbanization and its discontents uh, to help shape a better future? The big challenge for suburban retrofitting, which is the, the at least one of the responses I advocate in my own um, in my own research and, and activities, uh, is to improve the resiliency of the suburban landscapes um, as they currently exist, where the vast majority of uh, the North American population lives, um, and those folks represent all income levels all ages, all races, all countries of origin, really defying uh, stereotypes and that definition that Kenneth Jackson put out in the 1980s of, of suburban nights being affluent and, and middle class. Uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on whether you're a glass half empty or a half glass half, half full um, uh, type, um, there's lots of opportunity in the kind of obsolete and, and discarded commercial landscapes that take up a lot of land in, in suburbs. Let's see, a few more minutes here. So Retrofitting Suburbia was first published um, in early 2009. Uh, that was 10 years ago. Uh, and at that time, my uh, co-author and research um, partner, Ellen Dunham Jones and I had around 80 examples. Uh, now we've collected over a thousand of uh, retrofits of, of these uh, obsolete property types um, around um, North America. And so this big project of the 21st century, uh, we could say is really taking hold. Um, but what more can we do and how can we do it better? And so I just wanna wrap up with um, six challenges that we've identified for raising the bar on the next generation of suburban retrofits. And this is a preview of the framing for the the new book, which will come out early next year. So first, reduce auto dependency. So where possible, retrofit for a compact dynamic mix of uses so people can park once and do multiple things or not drive at all. Uh, resilient water and energy systems. So introduce green soft infrastructure in place of gray hard infrastructure for managing stormwater um, as in this image, we've got uh, bioswales and, and raid gardens, and this can be done at all different scales, I think, throughout these landscapes and places. Uh, improve public health. Uh, so research shows that physical design can support and encourage healthy physical activity. And it's vital in the face of epidemic levels of obesity, chronic disease, um, 
such as diabetes in this country, which is correlated with sedentary lifestyles. So retrofits, designers, planners can really bank on this knowledge. Support an aging population. Uh, so we can call ourselves active adults or perennials or whatever we want, uh, but a generation from now, fully one-fifth of the nation's inhabitants will be uh, older adults, people over the age of 65, myself included, um, and soon. <laughs> and you can see uh, the trend in the population pyramid, which is turning into more of a, a cliff face, uh, not so much a pyramid. Um, so what happens in suburbs when the car keys have to be taken away? compete for jobs. So let's switch from considering uh, boomers and the Gen Xers who are following them uh, to the millennials, now aged uh, early 20s to late 30s, and then the post millennials who are following them into the workforce. Uh, so old office parks and corporate campuses and actually shopping malls and other places can be retrofitted to attract and retain um, these workers. And the final challenge to touch on is leverage uh, suburban social capital to increase equity. Uh, I've argued that suburbs are not homogeneously the same. Socioeconomically, however, they can be highly fragmented and segregated places. And they've been, as the history shows, systemically structured uh, to be that way. Um, so social capital here is defined as networks of civic trust and social cohesion based in shared norms and values. Uh, networks of relationships among people who live and work in a particular society. And uh, we can say that these connections provide pathways for individuals to increase happiness and well-being and have um, more access to economic opportunity. So really here we're talking about the social infrastructure structure of the, the suburbs. Um, so how can retrofits and other kinds of planning activity raise the bar on this challenge? Um, so we could say that in re-inhabitation type retrofits of, of commercial spaces and so-called ethnoburbs, um, we can sort of cultivate and incubate new, new businesses um, where they can flourish. We, in redevelopment type retrofits, we can add and preserve housing affordability um, and choice. And that's what's happening in the image here in Wyandanche on, on Long Island. Um, and then re-greening retrofits could provide equitable access to an enhanced uh, civic realm, which you're also seeing here. This was a, a, a park or public space poor uh, community lacking um, that kind of amenity. Uh, so uh, I'll just close there and we'll turn it over to Dan. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. So let me get my slides here together. Awesome. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here today. My name is Dan Reed. Uh, I am a planner at Tool Design Group in Silver Spring, Maryland, and uh, I, I put this together not necessarily as a, as a conversation about what the, the solutions might be for our changing suburbs, but really as a, the start of a broader conversation about how our suburbs got the way they are and, what, and how we should think about them as we get ready for them to adapt. But first, um, normally I ask for a show of hands. Who here has seen the show The Wonder Years? Um, I can't see anybody's hand, so I'll just assume some of you have seen it. It was uh, a sitcom in the late 1980s, early 1990s on ABC. Uh, it was set in a sort of archetypal American suburb in the 1960s, uh, but it was also based on the uh, childhood homes of their two creators. Uh, Neil Martins grew up in Huntington, Long Island, New York, and Carol Black grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is where I live and work and is part of Montgomery County, Maryland, which is a county of a million people immediately north of Washington, D.C. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Montgomery County a lot because I think in the same way that this show is sort of a, a living document of what it was like to live in Montgomery County in the 1960s, I think Montgomery County tells us a lot about uh, the past, present, and future of our, of our suburbs. So. Uh, let me figure out how to get up. Oh, there we go. Right before that. <laughs> so uh, if, you were, if you were around in Montgomery County in the early 20th century, it was a, it was a magical time. The county was growing very fast. It doubled in population every decade uh, throughout most of the, the 20th century. And from the start, it was an uh, implied message that transportation and investments were running the show. In this 1920s era ad 
for homes in Silver Spring, the developer E. Brook Lee boasted that you could take the bus here and that the public investments being made were going to drive your private investments and uh, allow you to accumulate wealth. And that increasingly was the message of, of Montgomery County and a lot of suburban places that the, the government was going to provide public amenities, whether it was subsidized mortgages or uh, uh, streetcars or later uh, highways to uh, provide access to, to suburban land and that that would generate wealth for you. <clears throat> we would provide amenities in these new suburbs. Some of the, the first enclosed shopping malls in the nation were built in Montgomery County, uh, giving people access to shopping and all these new consumer goods they, they hadn't had access to prior to World War II. Uh, and it was, it was great. It was good and it was great. Uh, there were a few uh, wrinkles to this. One is that this was you know, arguably an unmitigated environmental disaster. Uh, sort of as, as June alluded to, we clear cut you know, tremendous amounts of land and gobbled them up for new subdivisions with little regard for you know, how those people would uh, necessarily get around or what would be in their drinking water. Uh, we largely decimated our, our urban centers through this project you know, as people who had the means to move out into these communities and to secure access to wealth and opportunities did so. Uh, and really hurt our, our urban centers and actually some of our older suburban communities too with successive waves of white flight went, went on. Uh, and not everybody really had access to these places either. Uh, if you wanted to shop in these new shopping malls and you were a person of color, you did not get to. If you wanted to purchase a home in one of these communities, uh, you would not get to if you were a, a person of color, if you were Middle Eastern, if you were uh, Jewish or Muslim, and in, in the bougier sections, if you were Eastern European or Catholic, you also did not really have access to these communities. Um, part, part of this was through mortgages and the federal government's redlining maps, which restricted who uh, could get a guaranteed mortgage, but also through zoning. You know, the Buchanan versus Worley was a Supreme Court decision in the 1910s that said you could not do zoning based on race, uh, but Euclid B. Ambler, which was a Supreme Court decision 10 years later, said you could uh, decide what kind of houses would be allowed in a community. So the result are these communities that are effectively laid out to segregate based on wealth. You have sections of single family homes of different prices and sizes and styles, each one separated from the others. In some places, if you're lucky, you might have some apartments and lower income housing, uh, but everything is, is fairly disconnected based on class and by extension on rates. And, and the roads, the public investments that we made to provide access to these places were itself also barriers. And thus uh, a, a county and a region and a nation were built on access for upwardly mobile white people with cars. And if you didn't fit into that box, well, you end up like this family did. So you rinse and repeat for 50 years, uh, more new suburbs, more outward expansion, more white and later middle-class flight further out from the cities, more provision of public amenities to support those places like schools, uh, more traffic as our regions grow bigger and, and larger and more stratified as people have to commute longer and longer distances, particularly less affluent people, to access jobs and education and, and just general social and economic opportunities. There's been a lot of talk about the Green New Deal in, in the past year or so, but one big blind spot it has is land use. And you know, writing in Slate Magazine, my, my friend Alex Baca notes that our physical geography, where we sleep, work, shop, and send our kids to play, uh, and how we move between those places is more foundational to a green, fair future than just about anything else. You know, to its credit, uh, Montgomery County has done a lot to address the land use side of things uh, and also the broader issue of climate change. You know, we have uh, tried to eliminate, we're, our goal is to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions by 2035. Uh, but one of the best ways that we can do that, as the California Air Resources Board points out, is by changing the way our communities are laid out and structured, uh, increasing the number of trips you can make by foot, having stronger urban growth boundaries, congestion pricing, and, and prioritizing active transportation, all of which involve how close are things to other things. So uh, I brought up the Wonder Years as an example of where our suburbs were, uh, but if you've seen the show Hey Arnold, you'll get a vision of where our suburbs and, and generally where metropolitan areas might be going. 
I, I recently started rewatching the show on Hulu. It's a, it's a 1990s cartoon on Nickelodeon about Arnold, who's the kid in the middle, uh, and his friends growing up in a big city. It's loosely based on its creator's childhood in Seattle, uh, and in general, having a pretty good time. And you can start to see visions of this experience in our suburbs today. You know, Montgomery County is home to one of the, the earliest examples of new urbanism, the Ketlands, which was built in the 80s and 90s, uh, and designed around the principles of historic towns and cities. And the result is a place where kids, even younger kids, can actually walk around and, and have you know, full lives without requiring their parents to drive them everywhere. These are places where uh, houses are finely mixed together by type and style and price range. Uh, there is a fine-grained network of streets and sidewalks to make it easy to walk or bike. Parking usually happens in the back on the alleys uh, to demonstrate that cars are less important here. And, and most crucially, there is often a network of robust public gathering spaces that you know, serve as a place where people can come and spend time, but also as an opportunity to build community and a shared identity that suburban places haven't always enjoyed. Uh, this is a suburban downtown in Montgomery County called Rockville Town Square, which was formerly a shopping mall. And this is downtown Silver Spring, which is that neighborhood I showed in the first slide where Eberkley was trying to sell houses in the 1920s and by the 1980s had largely been left for dead. Uh, and today has really seen a, a pretty fantastic resurgence. Uh, and a lot of that is due to, to county policies. And what's great about these places is that they are giving a more, I think, egalitarian access to all the amenities that make life good, access to transportation, access to jobs, access to schools, access to, to public facilities and shopping uh, made available to everybody regardless of their uh, background because they're simply more accessible and more centrally located. And we find that these places tend to be a bit more diverse than your typical suburb. Uh, here's a map of Ketlands and Lakelands, that first urbanist development, and you can see there's a mix of house types, a mix of price ranges, the highways off to the side, the form of barrier uh, within the community. And, you know, a, a lot of these new developments are pretty expensive, but they tend to be a lot more uh, price-wise diverse than your typical suburban community. The county has been doing a lot to, like many suburbs, to invest in new transportation, be it bus rapid transit or light rail to, to serve these communities and give alternatives to driving. A massive investment in bike lanes, the nation's uh, first protected bicycle intersection on the East Coast uh, just opened here in Montgomery County. And of course, investing in housing in these you know, suburban town centers where people can actually access jobs and opportunities without having to travel as far, without having to travel by car. So, uh, and we can see people responding to it. Most of the county's growth has been around uh, public transit. You can see the Oops, you can see the red line, uh, metro rail connecting Montgomery County to DC, and the darkest colored areas are people essentially clustering around that line and around major job centers. You can see driving habits have changed even since the Great Recession. They're sort of flatlined in the county. Uh, and the, the best examples I can think of how well we're doing it is because uh, I can see the changes in my friends' families. My parents bought a 1980 split level just like this one, uh, as you can see in the ad, uh, all my friends in high school bought the same kinds of houses and, and moved out into to then new suburbs. Uh, my, my, most of my friends have since moved closer in either to inner suburbs like Bethesda or Silver Spring or into DC itself. And what do you know, their, their parents are selling these houses at, at massive windfalls and moving downtown with their kids. It's great and it's wonderful and it's good, except. <laughs> Uh, I asked you about the Wonder Years, I asked you about Hey Arnold, but I'm curious how many of you have, have watched a public hearing on television or in person in your own community, and therein lies uh, the rub. This is, this is where we are right now. We've built a, a county and suburbs and regions and a nation on creating access to wealth through public resources and then protecting that access to wealth and opportunities. And the result is that the people who got to have access to those things who tend to be white often fight to keep it that way. You know, despite in this really strict zoning regime that Montgomery County, like a lot of suburbs, has had, 
you know, what has emerged is this thriving, messy, diverse place. We are a majority minority county. We have local music. We have local minority and immigrant owned businesses and massive uh, immigrant communities here. We have tight knit uh, social networks uh, that are diverse as well. And, you know, interesting artsy video things that also happen in these places. Uh, but they often happen in spite of, of suburban um, policies. You know, the result of building patterns that essentially say that one type of housing, the single family detached home, is acceptable and literally everything else around it, townhomes, apartments, storefront retail, uh, streets that are too narrow uh, and aren't designed around cars, is effectively uh, a variance from that and implicit uh, is that it's kind of deviant from what these communities were built for. And people work very hard to preserve that status quo because it was determined that this is how you're able to connect to wealth. Uh, and they, and they, pre they present in a variety of different ways. Occasionally, you'll find a neighbor or community member who uses explicitly prejudiced arguments talking about political agendas or implying that a certain policy, say, allowing accessory apartments or renting out your basement will turn uh, your community into the majority minority community next door. Uh, but it often takes a subtler tone. You know, there are strong cultural connotations to living in a suburb and what a suburb is. And, and many of the arguments against change in this community, like many suburbs, has been uh, these calls that our community is suburban, not urban, for what those, you know, what those words hold in their meaning. Sometimes it takes a social justice tack. Uh, these two women held a protest in front of a cooperative grocery store last year holding a sign saying, we can't breathe. Uh, if you think that they were protesting the murder of Eric Garner by a New York City police officer, I'm sorry to tell you that they were in fact protesting a shopping center that was proposed in that neighborhood. Uh, and likewise, opponents will often take environmental arguments. Uh, the town of Chevy Chase, which is one of the wealthiest communities in our county and in the nation, spent tens of thousands of dollars fighting a proposed transit line through their community. Uh, and similar neighborhoods have hired consulting firms that will, you know, effectively uh, protect, protect, the, protect you and the environment in your community uh, by keeping out apartment buildings, for instance. So, you know, suburbs are pretty politically diverse places. They are increasingly becoming more liberal as they become more diverse. We see this all over the country. And you might see signs like this in people's yards saying, no matter where you're from, we're glad you're a neighbor. Uh, and next to them, you might see a sign opposing some kind of development. And often that opposition to change comes with consequences. This particular sign blocked 700 homes, including affordable housing, a grocery store, eight acres of actual parkland, and medical offices, which in turn uh, creates this sort of game of musical chairs in which people who have historically had access to wealth and opportunities get first dibs on the chair, and literally everybody else who doesn't fit into that paradigm, the young, the old, uh, women, people of color, queer people, uh, basically get stuck without a chair when the music stops. Uh, this is a redlining map, to, to go all the way back to the 30s, of Washington, D.C. and the Maryland suburbs on the north side, on the top of the map here is Montgomery County. And you can see the darkest colored areas are the areas where the federal government would protect mortgages. And I wish I had a laser pointer because I want to direct your attention to the bottom of this page here. This is a map of commute times. The lightest colored areas have the shortest commutes. Those happen to be the darkest colored areas on the redlining map. People used the federal government's mortgages to protect their access to jobs and economic opportunities, and that stands today. You look at where poverty rates are in the county, the lowest poverty rates in the county are those areas where redlining occurred 80 years ago. You look at housing prices in the county, the areas where a middle income family cannot afford to buy a home, the lightest colored areas are those areas that were redlined in the 1930s. And you look at our school system, which is increasingly becoming segregated by class and race. Those schools on the right hand side that have the tallest bars representing the percentage of white students are those neighborhoods that were redlined 80 years ago. So even as our suburbs become more diverse, we're constantly butting up against policies that were made 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago 
for a community that looked very different than the way it does now. Uh, and people continue to work to protect their access to those public amenities that were in some that were originally intended for certain people. For instance, Winchester Homes is a big local builder in the DC area. They built these two split level houses in 1985. They both have four bedrooms and three bathrooms. They're both roughly 2,500 square feet. One of those houses uh, is currently served by a majority minority high school that is a little bit lower in the county's rankings. The other house is served by uh, majority white and Asian high school, which has, had, which has uh, one of the highest school rankings, not just in the county, but in the nation. And as it turns out, there is a $250,000 difference in home price between two literally identical homes in very similar neighborhoods, simply because of who goes to that neighborhood school. This creates a real challenge for Montgomery County and for a lot of suburbs like it in the future. You know, despite a, a, a narrative about growth in our downtowns and our urban cores, there's still a tremendous amount of growth happening in our suburbs. 200,000 people are gonna to move to this county in the next 20 or so years. That's a 20% increase. And where are those people going to go? This is a map of zoning in the county. Down at the bottom in the middle here are those areas that were redlined in the 1930s. Uh, the yellow areas are single family homes. The green areas are an agricultural reserve, which is excellent and good. Together, they make about 90% of the county's land. And what's left over, the areas that are actually able to accommodate future growth are the planned community developments, the town centers and shopping centers, uh, the office parks, industrial parks, and garden apartment complexes. Those are the places that are actually capable of accommodating new homes. Um, and those are the places where 208,000 new people who are likely to be majority minority, who are likely to be younger, who are likely to be you know, not fitting into that box many suburbs are originally created for, get to go in those places. And it also so happens that those places are where most of the county's diversity already are, and often where people don't have the means to dictate what kind of change happens in their community. So we're effectively putting all of the growth in the places that are least prepared to shape it. On the one hand, this is how it's supposed to be, right? You know, Montgomery County has a strong reputation for transit-oriented development, and as a result, 80% of the new homes in the county are going to these 10 neighborhoods, which are uh, either near uh, red line metro stations or are in uh, planned suburban town centers that were established in the 1960s. On the other hand, this isn't nearly enough to accommodate the, the growth that's actually coming to this community and the result is the little bit of housing that gets built near transit, near jobs, near town centers, near amenities, tend to be astronomically expensive. And thus the people who benefit the most from access to opportunities don't have the ability to participate in these places. They often get pushed out to places like this, older suburbs that were built in the 60s and 70s and 80s that are now starting to age and are getting hit by a double whammy of wealth moving either further out to even newer suburbs or moving further in to closer urban areas that have more opportunities. This is about a mile from the house that I grew up in, which was built in the 1980s. And this is a shopping center in that neighborhood that as recently as when I went to high school, I graduated in 2005, was a thriving strip mall filled with local businesses and shops and restaurants and was a community gathering place. And it's basically been left for dead. And so the question I want to leave you all with is, you know, we're going to, we need to think about our suburbs in a different way if we're going to help them change. But uh, once we understand where we're going, what are we supposed to do about it? That's my piece. And I'm going to, I'm going to give it over to, to John, to Mike, I believe for the, for the Q and A. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dan and June. Throughout the webinar, we have been assembling the questions posed by our audience. We'll now move into the question and answer session. You can continue to submit questions as we move into the discussion, and we'll answer as many as we can until about 2.30 Eastern. Um, and I'm going to ask our panelists if they can turn on their webcams so we can actually see them during this part. Excellent. Okay. So uh, one of the questions came up, I think, early in your uh, discussion, June. So I'm going to just relay this to you. And if you want to go ahead and respond to it, um, I, 
I don't recall what it exactly referred to, but you probably remember this. So please, please have June address the, the comment related to the definition of suburbs related to feminism. I did not get it, and I'm a female, so I'm interested in the point to be made by the comment. Okay. Um, well, I was partly uh, uh, referencing the scholar Dolores Hayden and what she added uh, to um, the sort of um, mainstream historical reemergence of studying suburban history in the 80s and, and 90s. Um, she had written really interesting books about um, feminist, a kind of first, uh, uh, it's called domestic feminism um, in the 19th century. Uh, Catherine Beecher was one of the main proponents of this who wrote a best-selling guide to um, housekeeping, basically. Uh, uh, in that, that period, and she argued for separate domestic spheres. So the men were in the city and the women actually had most of the power at, at home. That was her, her argument, um, that they were morally actually superior for that job of, of the home and, and child rearing. Even though she was a woman who never married and was a professional person herself, she was making that, that argument. And, um, and it had a lot of, of staying power, I would say. But that's a kind of first kind of domestic feminism. And then, uh, uh, Hayden also writes about uh, early communitarian examples, the emergence of apartment hotels where there might be um, in the whole building, like here in New York City, an apartment building where instead of having separate uh, personal kitchens, you might have a, a, a building kitchen uh, uh, that would provide uh, hot food for the apartments above, so like an apartment hotel. Um, and what that might be like as a, as a way to, to live. And it really didn't take off. Instead, what we had was a privatization of that idea uh, with fast food, right? So you pick up the hot food and, and bring it home rather than having it done collectively in your in your building. Um, so that certainly took off, right? Labor saving devices and, and so on. So that's a whole thread. And then you get into the period of the um, 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the, the 70s. And, and that, that questioning is more women were actually wanting but also economically being required to go into the workforce you know what did that mean to be um sort of out in in the periphery um and how that shifted all kinds of of patterns of um mobility and 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 so on so i think it's there's a whole lot of ways to to think about it but uh it certainly is a a thread to this history that that some historians like kenneth jackson um was less attuned to Okay, thank you. I will go on to the next question. Um, and this also came in early, so maybe we'll direct it to you, June, to start with. So can you speak to the racial divide caused by suburban development and white flight in terms of integrating a more diverse population to existing primarily white single family residential neighborhoods? Increased density is often correlated with increased crime or slash racial divides. Are there any strategies you suggest to combat this? I'm going to let, I want Dan to weigh in on this as well, certainly. Um, I, the question, I guess, came up while I was still speaking, and I think a lot of what Dan presented uh, probably answers that that question or, or opens it up and, and, and introduces perhaps even many, many more questions. I will say one thing. Um, the, the correlation of density and crime, I think, is something that, that we might need to and want to question. Is that being done? Um, you know, per capita. I certainly, I live in, in New York City where there's just been a remarkable uh, turnaround and we understand now this, this city that has neighborhoods that are among the most densely populated places in the country have has historically low uh, crime rates per, per capita, um, whereas other places less densely settled may have fewer crimes, but if you look at the, the crime per, per um, capita or per land area, it might, it might appear very, um, very different. So I think there's a, a lot of other factors to look at besides uh, density per se. Uh, Dan, do you want to? Yeah. Um, I think that diversity in a lot of our suburban communities, as I said, has kind of happened in spite, you know, in the, in the places where the zoning only allows a certain kind of housing, people make do. Uh, in my parents' neighborhood, which is a sort of archetypal 1980s split-level subdivision, you can find people who have uh, put in illegal basement apartments or have multi-generational families living in these large houses, in part because what else do you do with five bedrooms? Uh, and in part because that's, 
that was the the house was the raw material that was made available to you in in the absence of zoning that actually allows for a variety of housing types. So I understand that people come to this with a lot of fears. Uh, I would I would say in part you don't people don't always realize I think the the forms of diversity that exist in your neighborhood under the radar that you don't see and and in effect are are not really having a problem with. Uh, and and also, I think part of it is just better and more engagement. Uh, you many suburban communities often have different uh, groups living within them, different minority and immigrant groups, and what have you. And reaching out to those communities, one thing that's emerged is that people want different things. Uh, Dr. Shenlin Chang was a researcher at the University of Maryland who looked particularly at Latino and Asian. Uh, suburban suburbanites in the in the mid 2000s and found that their sort of ideal neighborhood was often uh, the sort of traditional American ideal of like a house with a yard, but with a more dense uh, town center nearby that in some ways was reminiscent of communities they had lived in in other countries because it provided access to shopping and social opportunities that were close at hand, that maybe within walking distance or a short drive. So I, I have found that that big demographic shift has, has driven a lot of the conversation around the physical environment shift here in Montgomery County, simply because people have, I think, different expectations of what suburbs are. And the, the Overton window of what is acceptable to build here is slowly being dragged uh, towards a more urban form. I just want to also follow up with a question of how we measure density. I think a lot of these post-war suburbs, the post-World War II suburbs, um, there was relatively low density if you compare it to an apartment building of having detached houses all, all side by side. But the average family size, the number of people living in each of those units was larger. Right? Having children, you had four, five, six, seven member families. And over time, we've seen the average family size shrink. And so you have the same built area, but it's housing one, two, three people, right? So the same physical environment today houses half as many people. So you have half the density with the same number of units, potentially in some neighborhoods, and then others you have people in the basements and, and, and so on. So looking at not just the number of housing units as a measure of, of density and potentially providing affordability, but also factoring how many people are being housed and being housed well, I think is, is important as well. Okay, thank you. The next question is, how do we create a new economic development model to intensify development to redevelop our suburbs? Are accessory dwelling unit solutions to redeveloping suburbs? I, I think they are a solution. Uh, not not the only one, but they're definitely part of the picture. Uh, one thing I always like to, to joke about suburban places is they do have a lot of latent space available, whether it's the basement of a large uh, suburban McMansion or the parking lot in front of a shopping center or uh, an eight lane road that is empty most of the day. There, there's room for more stuff uh, that people don't always anticipate. And so I think for, for many aging suburban communities, like economic development, I think really is about how do you better utilize the those the vacant spaces that you have uh, and put them put them to to greater or more intense uses, which you know, as I think June can can speak to, comes in a variety of different forms. Just to follow up on that, the the those two maps of uh, Montgomery County that you showed, Dan, one with all of the the land use, and then the one where you blacked most of that out. Those are the places that are much more likely to have um, R1 zoning, right? And by allowing accessory dwelling units or, or um, uh, backyard units, basement units, you could sprinkle within all of that at least some percentage of that growth that you anticipate. And, and whether it's a, a within family second unit, so an adult child or a, a aging parent, or even this kind of extended social families that some of us have. So it's an aunt or an uncle aging that may not be biologically related to you, but someone that you have a strong tie with and want to bring in and share share your home with. Um, I think a lot of uh, uh, people could be better housed by opening that up. And that's about shifting this paradigm about this presumed superiority and um, stability and 
preference for an ideal of a detached house and yard and a presumptive uh, normative family uh, living within that, that unit. So, uh, but there is, you know, a whole variety of, of issues and challenges. So some places have a lot of these units, but they're illegal. So we want to legalize those, bring them into the light, be able to then monitor and make sure that they're safe and up to code and taxes are being collected and, and all kinds of, of things like that. And then other places it's unlocking a potential that's there, but has been very strictly monitored. Uh, so it is low hanging fruit in the, in the equation, certainly on the housing, the housing question. Okay. There are a lot of questions actually related to accessory dwelling units or ADUs. So I'll ask one of them as a follow-up here. So appreciate all the background to understand how we got to where we are, but now what? What are some of the tools you can suggest to address this? Is is it down zoning to allow ADUs, but then we deal with over parking concerns, et cetera? Uh, so we had a, a big fight over accessory apartments in Montgomery County and it was surprising to me to see how uh, virulent some of the opposition was, uh, but fortunately it, it did get passed. I think in, in spite of some of the more um, prejudiced arguments that people made, I, I think it actually demonstrated that, it, it demonstrated to the decision makers, the county council, that uh, a lot of the opposition to this was not coming from the best place. That's it. Uh, parking was a recurring issue among, uh, I think, people who were either skeptical of the proposal or were outright opposed to it. Um, one of the things that the, the, the law of the county passed did is that homes within a certain distance of transit uh, do not have parking requirements, uh, which I think does a couple of things. One is it, it acknowledges that the people who might be living in these accessory apartments who are overall less likely to drive cars uh, will have other transportation options available to them in those neighborhoods. And I also think you know, these communities are often the places that have the most limited parking, street parking especially, in the first place. And you know, not requiring that the accessory apartment owner has to demonstrate parking availability, I think reduce, could ultimately reduce the pressure for parking in that neighborhood. Because if their working assumption is the person in this apartment is not going to have a car, it ideally means one fewer car taking up street space for all the other homes in that neighborhood. And to follow up on that, if the renter doesn't want a unit without a guaranteed parking space, then they'll look elsewhere. If, they're, right. if that's what they are comfortable with, why have a requirement to build that space that, that isn't going to be needed by the, by the person who is presumably desirous of that, of that unit? So I, it, those arguments go, go together. Um, one thing that's interesting about accessory dwelling units, I, I reviewed a paper that was recently published, I can't remember which planning journal it's in now, but uh, uh, they were studying accessory dwelling units on Long Island, which is a huge suburban region in, the, in my area, in, in metropolitan New York, uh, with almost 2 million people in um, Nassau and Suffolk County, and surveying all the different jurisdictions of which there are dozens of overlapping towns and villages and hamlets and unincorporated areas and so on. Um, the units can't be counted, the legal ones. There's no, it's incredibly difficult to even count how many there are uh, with all sorts of different kinds of regulations. Um, so so it, it's hard to really measure the impact because um, it's difficult to get the numbers even. Okay, uh, next question I think follows up, although it was asked before you spoke, Dan, on what you were saying earlier. Um, given the increasing diversity in our population, especially with the Gen Z reaching adulthood, and what we are seeing with immigrant populations contributing to growth in the suburbs, what role do you see these groups playing in this watershed moment for revising our suburban environments? Um, I think they're going to uh, play a pretty big role in it, whether it's in terms of you know, folks just going out to, to vote and electing, I think, different uh, kinds of local officials in these communities and showing up to, to community meetings and participating through all the existing um, forums that are available for suburban input. But I really think the larger, the larger sea change is just going to be in people living their lives differently within the, the space that is given over to them. Um, in terms of like gently, what I would call gently dragging the Overton window. Uh, I, I have noticed just in the past couple of years here in Montgomery County that as I see friends, you know, looking for places to rent, I discover all of these 
somewhat not legal rooming houses that have just appeared for uh, particularly near jobs and near metro stations for younger people who need a room to rent and can only afford six or seven hundred dollars a month in an area where an apartment will rent for seventeen hundred dollars a month. I see a lot more roommate situations than I used to, and I see a lot more people willing to take a chance on like opening bars and restaurants and, and breweries than even just a couple of years ago. Part of that is because the laws have changed in an area that has a fairly restricted liquor regime. Uh, but those individual people making individual decisions about how they're going to live and what kind of businesses they're going to open and where they're going to open them, those I think are the real signs that we're going to see of how people are adapting these places to their own needs that are happening outside of policy decisions, but will ultimately force the hand of policymakers to adapt. You know, we wouldn't have been talking about accessory apartments and passing that that law this year if there weren't already so much evidence in our neighborhoods that people are already doing this uh, uh, just outside of uh, regulations. And to, to follow up on that, and again, I really do like those two maps of the county that you showed, those, mm -hmm. those reception areas, it may look like just small areas in the overall map, they still have tremendous potential. Yeah. If you uh, add up all of these commercial areas, that image of the one mall in Florida being equivalent in area to an entire dense city, you could actually accommodate a lot of new housing and housing choices that could attract the younger generations coming in, but also um, the their grandparents who who are going to live longer, many of them, and outlive their ability and their desire perhaps to, to drive. And it's not always going to be fixed transit, but ride sharing and other kinds of systems that will emerge to help with mobility in those groups. And that'll encourage a results and or a, a kind of twinned uh, uh, efficiency in, in the different places that those people will be wanting to go frequently and habitually. So making these sort of smaller networks or networks between each of those nodes within the larger landscape is tremendous potential, I think. Uh, uh, and so the retrofitting of the strip centers and the big box stores and, and always adding some different housing types, um, shared housing types perhaps into the mix where you could purposely design something for four or five, six um, adults to share and, and use design as a way to, to think about making that not only um, desirable, but also potentially more affordable because of the shared um, uh, kind of paying for the uh, infrastructure or the amenities or the utilities that, that otherwise would just be in six separate um, studios or, or or smaller apartments. Um, so what the new loft living will be like, uh, you know, from the 70s and 80s, the old industrial areas that got recycled and repurposed into cool districts. Um, I think we're already seeing that happening uh, with some of these uh, commercial suburban sorts of, of districts. So the, the ubiquitous Gap and Home Depot and all of those are all gonna, potentially with designers and cool kind of creative thoughts could all differentiate and evolve into, into really interesting places. Yeah, I, I can already think of maybe five or six examples in the county of, of office parks and former office buildings that have been converted to residential because the buildings, especially those from the 50s and 60s, are no longer viable as commercial buildings uh, and have since been uh, are, but are actually really well suited for residential. Uh, I myself used to live in a in a condominium that was a converted ginger ale bottling plant that located in the suburbs in the 1940s because that was where there was available land, and you know no longer is suitable for for ginger ale, uh, but is suitable for housing. I'll also add to this. I have a teenage son, and um, he's a very active num tot. Right, new urbanist meetings for transit oriented teens. And in his high school, they have a transit club. And what they do for fun is ride trains and buses all around the metropolitan area. They've even gone on a trip from Manhattan all the way up to um, Massachusetts. So, so there's this kind of excitement you see in some kids when it used to be maybe about getting a cool car, uh, it's about being up with the latest transit. Okay, so we received several questions about kind of the uh, retrofitting of the retail into something else. So I'll maybe combine a couple and, and ask more specifically. So um, 
one question was a comment in 1974 Kurth published a new life for abandoned service stations have we seen something comparable ad addressing abandoned malls and Dan in the case the example that you uh, cited uh, would you have some ideas for how you might see that being redesigned um June has written a book about this right yeah. <laughs> a book. so at the very first slide that I showed um, my uh, book, Retrofitting Suburbia, that I co-authored with Ellen Dunham Jones, and I refrained from showing those kinds of case studies. They've been well published. You can search other YouTube videos and things of either myself or Ellen, um, uh, TED Talks, uh, going over some of those examples that um, specifically talk about uh, the 200 or more regional shopping malls plus dozens and dozens of, of strip centers and big box um, buildings. Uh, as well as office parks and office buildings that have been retrofitted into, into new uses and, and forms. And when we say retrofitting, uh, we're talking um, three basic strategies. So uh, redevelopment, which is basically partial or full demolition of the, of the older buildings and replacing them with a new configuration. So there's a real urban design component there that might involve, if the location is good, taking a mall and tripling the density on that land, um, adding transit, new kinds of retail that might be street-oriented retail with transit above, adding housing um, with apartments above, adding other kinds of business uses and so on, and really making a, a downtown district. Um, there are some really great examples of, of that. And again, I refer you to Retrofitting Suburbia um, and some other uh, articles and, and, and so on. And then the new book, uh, which will come out next year, Ellen and I have uh, 33 new fully fleshed out and illustrated case studies that uh, address those six challenges I talked about. So the idea here is not just to reproduce some of the examples that have already uh, been successfully developed and implemented uh, around North America, but to think about ways that we could really get even more um, and challenge ourselves to, to do better. Uh, so look for that coming out early uh, next year with examples that we've, we've studied and visited all across um, North, North America. Uh, the, the second strategy that we describe is re-inhabitation. So that's a kind of adaptive reuse model and the, the strip mall that, that Dan showed. We have some examples like of one in um, Oregon where the owners took out a couple of the inline stores to make a passageway so that they could activate the, the back of the center because often these centers are, are you know, L-shaped and the parking is all in front and the back is, is just kind of nothing. Um, and then use those little passages with putting some roof over it so that they could put seating and have good spilling out and making these like social year round social spaces. So it's not just parking your car, going into the business, coming back out again, but really socially activating um, and making a, a kind of third place for the community, even with the existing buildings and perhaps adding community serving uses, getting the post office there, getting a, a library, getting a, a daycare, um, senior care, uh, other kinds of, of uses. Um, the two categories that, uh, from a development perspective, we've seen come up in a lot of the re-inhabitation retrofits are medical, medically oriented uses. Um, so a whole shopping mall in uh, um, Nashville that uh, Vanderbilt University took over the second floor. So they consolidated all the remaining retail on the first floor, it was a two-story mall, and put the Vanderbilt outpatient clinic all on the second floor. So using the kind of concourse of the mall as you go from a radiology appointment to um, seeing your, your primary care physician and then there's a snack place and, and so on. And then you could still go pick up some things at a store on your, on your way out and you've only driven and parked. Um, once. So uh, they also have the back office um, you know, billing and, and so on for the, the medical center in one of the old anchor department stores that has the large floor plate and they've got the cubicle set up for people working there. So there's so many examples. Um, and then the third major strategy is re-greening. Uh, so ways to redress what is often an imbalance of truly public accessible community space, and, and Dan talked about that in showing those images where you might have a fountain, a plaza. Um, a lot of suburbs, 
especially the post-war ones, you had the residential areas, you might have recreational areas, but a place where people could just sort of be outside together that you might have associate with, with uh, um, center cities were, were lacking. So adding plazas and little parks, paseos, uh, town greens um, are, are part of these retrofitting strategies. And then maybe you could put up a, a little kiosk and in the summer show films at night and get people together of different types for different sorts of, of programmed activities um, that are open to, to everyone. Not There's no sort of pay to participate um, concept associated with that. Okay, thank you. Oh, I mean, there's so many examples. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us again what the name of the book is? Retrofitting Suburbia. And the new one? Urban Design Solutions for Redesigning Suburbs is my uh, main volume. There's also, if you search online, um, uh, uh, you can find uh, tactics for retrofitting suburbia on the Build a Better Burb website. Um, there's a TED Talk that my uh, co-author Ellen Dunham Jones did called Retrofitting uh, suburbia. Um, there's a book chapter in the book, uh, ret is it Retrofitting Sprawl? No, I forgot the name of the book <laughs> that I showed in my first slide, um, where I, I have a chapter in that on 11 tactics on, on retrofitting uh, suburbia. And I've learned that that's becoming required reading in many urban design programs. So I'm happy about, uh, about that. Um, yeah, so. There's a recent article we did about, uh, specifically it was in AD Magazine, so Architectural Design Magazine, about re-inhabiting strip centers and big box um, uses. Oh, community colleges are often like satellite campuses for community colleges are, are showing up uh, in re-inhabitation type retrofits. Okay, who is funding these types of retrofit projects, mainstream or private sources? I'd say all of the above, and and that's um, and one of the broader arguments is uh, tax code and other kinds of things. And Dolores Hayden is is quite good on this in her her history, uh, depreciated um, depreciation, accelerated depreciation in the tax code, encouraged uh, a, a kind of overbuilding of commercial developments and and getting a rate of return, getting the profit in the first five or 10 years without really the requirement for some sort of long-term uh, resiliency strategy for these developments. Um, so now we're, you know, uh, having to pay the piper for, for that kind of building um, boom. And in some cases, depending on what's happened uh, uh, around these commercial centers, they go into tax receivership and they become publicly owned. And then it becomes uh, sort of the responsibility of the local municipality to figure out um, either maybe to downsize it and turn it into a park or somehow get rid of the, the eyesore that's driving down values of, of neighboring um, properties. And that can be done quite successfully uh, where you, you um, deconstruct a shopping mall and maybe if it was built on wetlands or an area um, that has some ecological function that was compromised that can be brought back so there's a really exa interesting example in Connecticut that's going to be in our next book of a shopping mall that was demolished um, by through, through public funding and then a, a stream that had been put underground culverted and there have been really really destructive floods as, as a result of that in, in recent years um, bring back the stream and actually regrade the land that the mall was in into a kind of sunken park that then is a, a, a stormwater basin when there are extreme um, storm events. So, and it's then an amenity and they can show films there and have, you know, um, uh, public gatherings and, and, and so on. Um, so, uh, I'm losing the thread here. Um, but we were, um, can you remind me again that question I, I lost? Uh, oh, that, that that's okay. I think you've answered it there. Okay. So I could go on and on. <laughs> There's so you know so many interesting things that can be can be done with these properties. Absolutely. No, and 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 I thank the audience for submitting so many questions. We're actually um, we won't be able to get to all of them, but I'll ask Dan one. Dan, can you address why you do not believe that people living in urban areas and mixed use uh, higher density locations do not have the means to dictate? what kind of change happens in their community? 
I, mean, I, I think it's really an issue of disadvantaged, historically disadvantaged and oppressed communities not having the ability to dictate change where they live. Uh, in, you know, to use this county as an example, uh, redlining back in the day established where the government would essentially protect your wealth and who had access to those communities to protect their wealth. And those people tended to be more affluent white people because of the laws that were in place at the time. And zoning codified the built patterns of those places as single family residential homes only. And everything that sort of sits outside of that is sort of where everyone else gets to go. Whether it's here in Montgomery County, Maryland, or throughout the country, the areas that were redlined tend to be where the most affluent neighborhoods are today. And so those communities often have the most wealth for starters, but also tends to be where the jobs are, particularly in suburban communities. Chris Leinberger talks about the idea of the favorite quarter, which is the sort of direction that jobs and wealth go in a region. Um, and so in particularly suburban communities where land is zoned for anything that is not single family homes, particularly higher density development apartments and stuff, those usually, those often end up where other people don't want the, where, um, where nobody could protest those things happening and where uh, nobody, or ultimately where nobody was there to complain about it, right? You know, whether it's the, the shopping mall being located at the edge of town where there aren't any of butters or uh, here in Montgomery County, the revitalization of downtown Silver Spring, which was a historic urban center in a historically uh, less affluent, less, more diverse part of the county where there was actually a lot of support for development and there wasn't the strong, there wasn't the same kind of strong opposition to density and to urban built form that there was in more affluent sections of the county. I, you know, I wanted to pick up the thread because now I remember the question. I've been <laughs> talking about some examples where it went into public ownership and then the, the retrofitting, which might involve uh, actually lessening of density or regreening uh, was was done by the public sector. Then there are examples where it's a public-private partnership and some sort of tax benefit or something is done in order to attract uh, uh, some private in investment. And then there's a kind of shared custody of the of the project, like in Silver Spring. Um, and then there's, there's purely um, private-driven uh, projects where the demand is high. And actually, I think Montgomery County, when you're talking about these formerly redlined areas that now have become the most desirable areas, that's not the common condition, I would say, in most metropolitan areas around the New York. So you're going to see um, places like metropolitan DC, New York, the Bay Area, uh, in California, where there's a high demand for housing and housing prices are really high. And, and you know, this, this as you outlined this weird conflict between people who tend to see themselves as um, progressive and liberal, but what can be actually against some of the unlocking, some of the potential to, to add more housing into the, into the supply, um, where that has happened, that flip. And then there are many, many other metropolitan areas where the, the once redlined areas have this persistent effect and are still, still really, really, um, really struggling. Uh, um, but I, I will say the larger um, narrative in the retrofitting examples that Ellen and I have tracked is that what started out often as a kind of prototype development that got reproduced all around the country, now as we retrofit these projects, each one has a unique, particular, specific, local solution that needs to be found with the right partners and taking the surrounding context into um, into consideration. Okay. Uh, to change gears a little bit, uh, what are your thoughts on the future of jobs in suburbia? Do you envision another job-based retrofit as part of, as more of the hipsterbia trend takes hold? And if so, what uh, does that look like? Um, I, I think it de depends. Uh, one thing that we've noticed in the D.C. area and particularly Montgomery County is that the further out suburban communities where there may currently be office parks or where uh, land was set aside for employment uses have actually really been struggling. Um, there's a community called Clarksburg, which is 30 miles north of Washington, D.C., where in the 60s, Cesar Pelli designed this, this beautiful 
uh, modernist office campus called Comsat, which has been vacant for the past, I think, 15 or 20 years and is, is perpetually uh, at threat of being torn down. Uh, but in the 60s, it was decided this is a place where people would want to come and work. And now that's not the case, partially because um, there's been intensification both in the city, in the district, and in the sort of older suburban town centers like Bethesda and Silver Spring that have emerged as major regional job centers um, and I think are, are sucking up most of the employment activity in the region. So some office parks, I think, will have an opportunity to uh, reemerge as new kinds of workplaces if they're in the right locations in the region, but uh, more secluded or isolated uh, out, uh, office parks may, may not fare as well. I can speak to a case study that's going to be in the in the new book uh, of um, Bell Works, which is a reimagining of the old uh, Bell Labs um, campus, a research and development campus in in New Jersey that was designed by Aero Saarinen. So, like the the campus by Caesar Pelli, a, a real marquee name architect, and it's it's a beautiful building. It's a quarter mile long uh, with this huge atrium up at the center, and it was where uh, you know, telephones and all kinds of telecommunications um, technologies were, were developed and it was vacant for, for many years. So now it's been reimagined as what the developers call a metro verb and they're going to reproduce this outside of uh, Chicago as well in an edge city uh, there with another um, Bell AT&T uh, uh, building. But bringing in all sorts of different businesses and taking the atrium in the middle and really activating it. So they have farmer's markets and there's a hairdresser and there's a Montessori school and there's a, um, a branch of the local public library and they have fireworks on 4th of July. And, um, but the transportation is a problem, it has tons of surface parking, it's a beautiful landscape design of paving <laughs> and garden. Um, but they need to figure out and they have instituted uh, shuttles to go to the nearest New Jersey transit train station. Um, but at least for the people who are now working there, there are cool places to have lunch and different kinds of businesses. And, and it, it sort of has a little bit of a, a social vibe to it. And they really are trying very, very hard to um, attract and, and serve the needs of the millennials and those who are following them who have to work in New Jersey. <laughs> And uh, I think there's a lot of potential there for at least some of these white elephant office um, office parks and former headquarters uh, campuses to to evolve in in this way with the right kind of um, uh, uh, people involved in the in the process. All right. Thank you. I know we're notice we're getting toward the bottom of the hour. Do you have a few extra minutes to ask? answer a couple more questions? Sure. Sure. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so here's one. I'm also curious about how both of you would approach suburbs and shrinking areas. Should they be first on the block for decreasing funds or investment? Who has the responsibility for carrying the cost of supporting and reinvesting in suburban areas? We've subsidized these developments to a great extent. Is this a pattern that we can continue? Uh, that's a tough. It's a tough question. Uh, from my perspective as an architect and urban designer, we've been sensitive to try and look at examples that are in low or slow growth um, areas, and to see um, how the strategies of of regreening, which I talked about earlier, which can be about um, stabilizing an area and trying to leverage uh, could be federal funds if it's brownfields. Um, or creating the damage from flooding and other kinds of things so that you could argue funding for planning and, and investing in, in restructuring some areas in order to prevent um, much more catastrophic uh, damage down, down the line. Um, and then the examples of re-inhabitation. So just trying to improve, reduce the, the barriers in terms of, of zoning or other regulations that to unlock the potential of the people who are living in these places to um, be, be entrepreneurial or to, to create their own small businesses, to repurpose and reuse uh, uh, buildings that chain retailers have, have left behind um, and, and try to just kind of 
locally uh, stabilize and, and invigorate a, a community that's still, it may not be about attracting new outside development or bringing in a lot of new residents. It's really about um, stabilizing the conditions for the, the folks who are, who are already there. Yeah, I, I, I will admit that it's um, not really a phenomenon we see as much of in, in the DC area. I, I would say in general, it's, it's probably unsustainable economically to, to prop up these places, but I would also argue that particularly as uh, some of our urban cores, even in, in smaller uh, American cities, start to attract wealth and investment, that these places will increasingly be where the, the last lease and the lost end up and uh, we might find ourselves in the position of supporting some of these shrinking suburban places simply because that's where people who have no other choice end up. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, there was one slide that referenced autonomous vehicles and it seemed to be dismissed as fantasy. The future of autonomous vehicles re will revolutionize life in the suburbs as well as everywhere else. It may be 10 to 20 years out, but it's coming. What do the pre presenters think will change as a result, and should suburbs start planning now for this? So I was a little glib with that image, but the point to be made there is folks who think that a technological fix will take care of all of it. Um, maybe uh, some misguided thinking, and I think we have to be sensitive to how a lot of um, the narratives around autonomous vehicles are being promoted and shared by those with a huge financial stake in creating a narrative of inevitability uh, uh, about it that isn't paired, I don't think, by the questioning of um, what it might mean more broadly for rethinking some of the patterns that, that we have. So a lot of the narratives like that image show, still assuming sort of private individual car ownership just instead of you driving, it's, it's autonomous. So why do we then assume it'll still be one person in the vehicle or there'll be the same number of vehicles or they'll be going on the same sorts of, of routes? So the adoption of the new technological paradigm and vision, but still assuming that the kind of social behavior or cultural behavior will remain unchanged is, is something that I think is, is going to be interesting to track as it unfolds. I think already we've seen some of those predictions of when those changes were going to happen being stretched and put much more forward in the, in the future than, than, um, than it was first uh, uh, proposed. Um, I am all for autonomous transit, and I think that's a more likely scenario, but one that, that is perhaps a, a more of a, a backbeat in how these things are, are discussed. Um, so, so it's not to dismiss it. It really was just to to talk about how um, there won't be a singular technological fix in in my view. I, I think that the geometric constraints of autonomous cars are are still the same as cars. They still, especially with a single person in one, it still takes up space like a car does. It still requires roads like a car does. It still requires parking lots like a car does. And uh, you know, I've heard folks say that. Uh, people will be willing to have longer commutes in an autonomous car and thus they will move further out. And I don't necessarily believe that either because, you know, I think if Marchetti's constant is that uh, cities will, uh, the largest of city will grow is 45 minutes by whatever the prevailing transportation mode is at the time. And an autonomous car going 45 minutes is still a car going 45 minutes. And as we saw in the Great Recession, the areas that were, you know, furthest from the jobs are the ones that were hit the hardest. And I, I don't, I don't know that autonomous cars change that necessarily. Uh, I, I do anticipate they'll come at some point, but uh, I agree with June that they'll they'll come in forms that we don't fully anticipate, uh, like those little uh, delivery robots yeah. that scoot around some downtowns or uh, Domino's I pizza. I showed a slide of those. I, car yeah. That delivers pizza. Like I, I think we'll see that <laughs> way sooner. <laughs> Okay, just one or two more here. Do you see a role for regional agencies in turning around the suburban model? And if so, how can regional agencies be better empowered to do this? I hope they figure it out. Because <laughs> I think it's, it's a huge um, challenge. And, and one of the ways that suburban areas are distinct from central cities is the fracturing of the governance um, that that becomes an, 
impediment for implementing what really are good ideas and, and implementing them in um, equitable systemic uh, uh, ways. So, so you end up with um, some of these, these uh, uh, changes only being able to be implemented at the level of a, a local jurisdiction if there is will for it. Now that could all kind of snowball or add it up or be networked all, all together. And that's where I think a lot of regional agencies um, have the potential to uh, share knowledge and outcomes, to collect data that is uh, hopefully more convincing than other kinds of rhetoric that often sometimes it's it's as as Dan and I guess I have also uh, uh, described can be racially coded um, in destructive and and divisive ways so how do we get to conversations that cut through some of that and and identify some of our shared goals um, that could benefit everyone uh, in in our communities I so think we, oh sorry <laughs> Uh, I think particularly in terms of economic concerns, we're going to start to see suburbs working together more closely as their tax bases shrink or change. Uh, one benefit we have in the mid-Atlantic is our, we don't have a lot of uh, balkanized suburban communities. Like most, most things happen at the county level in Maryland and Virginia, but even still, uh, large suburban counties of eight, nine, hundred thousand people, a million people are, are experiencing budget issues and economic development issues. Uh, one big news that came out here last week is that uh, 10 different jurisdictions, cities and counties in Northern Virginia are forming a joint economic development authority to basically market that area as a shared region uh, and to uh, address regional issues together. And I think that's really important uh, because we don't we don't live within the single boundaries of an individual suburb, whether it's a, a small town or a county, um, and we're gonna we're gonna have to band together more and more in in the future uh, to to have a I guess a political reality that aligns with the physical reality that people live every day. Okay, I guess we'll have one last question here. Um, in Southern California, we have a huge gap between affordability and job location. Furthermore, current residents have their slice of the pie and do not want uh, more density due to perceived increases in congestion. If they could not afford their own house now if they had to buy it today. How do you address these issues in terms of public engagement and education that has worked elsewhere? You know, we have a, uh, this, this, Last week, the, the mayor of D.C. said that the solution to uh, NIMBYism was to basically shame affluent suburban people into uh, accepting affordable housing in their neighborhood. And I'm not totally sure if I agree with that, uh, mostly because people react poorly uh, to, to guilt and shame. Uh, I think the real issue is creating the, the political will to do the right thing. Uh, and to uh, make sure that elected officials understand that the voices against change are not the only constituency that they should be paying attention to. Uh, and whether that's better public engagement and reaching out to different communities may have different views. I think that's a big part of it. Um, and also creating a political regime in which elected officials are not rewarded for uh, giving in to, to people who don't want development in their neighborhood. I will say, um, as a former resident of Southern California, when I go back to, to visit, um, I lived there um, almost 20 years ago now, it's remarkable how much has seems to have changed in the acceptance of transit, for example, and the recognition uh, that uh, at least if some people, those who prefer to, to drive, if they understand that other people take transit, it, it's a net benefit for, for those who, who want to persist in, in, in driving. Um, and I think when you look at uh, certainly the Los Angeles metropolitan region and to some degree, I guess, um, San Diego as, as well, although um, if you really pull out um, and aggregate all the numbers, it seems very, very dense. But when you zoom in, there's not a lot of uh, uh, density gradients. So there's an opportunity to differentiate and shift that, that density around um, in ways that then could make it more more efficient um, uh, to move to move around in, in some of the commercial 
landscapes might be the places to to do that. Um, but but the the public education and, and engagement I think does have to start with the with the young. Okay. Well, on that point, uh, we'll close up today. Thank you very much, uh, June and Dan, for joining us today. And thanks for everybody uh, who joined with us. Um, the last few webinars with the Congress for the New Urbanism have been some of our best attended, and we just weren't able to get to all the questions today. So that will conclude our webinar, Suburbs for Everyone, How to Rethink, Redesign, and Redevelop the Burbs to be More Affordable and Livable. Um, I'd like to thank again June and Dan for their presentation. All those who attended the complete webinar, the recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org uh, sometime early next week. Uh, when you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. And keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and our weekly e-newsletter for details on other future webinars. Have a great day.